so um, uh, so interleaving. So you got process one. There's only one CPU. So as soon as it's blocked, you go to process two. As soon as it's blocked, well, you can either go to process one or three. Um, scheduler shows process one again. Process one goes. It gets blocked. You go to process three. So you'll notice at any one time, only one process is running of the three because you only have one CPU. All right. Now the other option is to do something like this, where now we've got two processes. So process one comes up, we start it. Process two comes up, we start it. Process one and two are actually both running at exactly the same time. Process three comes up and it says, eh, sorry, we don't have the available CPUs. Process one completes, okay, um, but process three is still um, currently blocked. Process two completes, now process three starts executing because it says, hey, I'm unblocked but we still only have one CPU running. Eventually, process one becomes unblocked. It starts running, okay? So now we have two things running again. Um, eventually, three completes. We go to two, two's unblocked, two's running, one completes, and then, I um, mean, sorry, two completes, one got blocked for a bit, finally gets unblocked, and it runs. So you can see at one point, right here, we had two things running. Here we only had one thing running. Here we only had one thing running. Here we had two. Here we actually had nothing running, okay? Because both of these had completed, and process one was blocked. So actually, zero CPUs were being used. And then finally, probably because we were waiting on I.O. or something like that. And then finally, you had the one thing and it completes. So depending on whether you have one or multiple CPUs, you can either be, uh, do quote unquote concurrency by interleaving or by overlapping. Okay, so this is cool. We can now run multiple things at the same time. Well, the problem is um, you can get into what's called a race condition, okay? Because we don't have any guarantees that this process is going to run before that process, right? Because both of them can be put in the ready queue, and it's up to the scheduler to decide, well, this one's going to run, or that one's going to run. And you are not guaranteed that this one's going to run before that one. So that was, again, the producer-consumer problem. You're not guaranteed that the producer is going to produce be run more times than the consumer wants to consume. So in order to do that, we have to talk between the processes. Right? We have to communicate some way, hey, I've got X many things in the buffer, uh, and that's enough for you to go ahead and consume uh, that many things. So you have to be able to communicate without overriding each other's data, okay? or without getting false or incomplete information. All right, so let's look at an example of that. So let's say we had two processes, process one, process two. They both call the echo method, okay? And all the echo method does is say, hey, get care. So it's gonna get something from the keyboard. It's gonna go ahead and set um, care out equal to whatever the care in is. And then it's gonna print that care out to the monitor. So when I type Y on the keyboard, a Y is gonna show up in the uh, screen. Well, let's say we've got process run one running echo. And it goes ahead and says, hey, okay, character n equals get character. I hit X. Then it gets swapped out and process two comes in. So it goes ahead and it runs character n equals get character. And I type a Y. So now uh, care n equals Y. Well, then I go and I say put character. So what's uh, care out currently, Y, right? So we're going to see a Y on the screen. Process 2 completes, then we switch back to process 1. But what is care out currently? Y. So it prints the current value of care out, a Y. So what you see on the screen is Y, Y, not X, Y. Okay? 
Okay? So, and the reason was because it stopped between this get care and the setting of care out. Now, if it had gone uh, care in, care out, I mean, had done all three of these in process one and then all three of these in process two, we would have seen X and Y. Now, there's obviously a situation where you could have seen X and X, right? So this is one of those, what's called a race condition, depending on who got there first as to whether we're gonna see XX, YY, or XY. That's what we want to be able to prevent. Uh, another example of that is, let's say you have a print school, okay? And um, the way they've implemented that is they've got a uh, out pointer that says, hey, this is the next thing that's going to be printed out. And then they've got an end pointer, well, this is the next thing to push onto the stack. So if I want to go ahead and put something in this print school, I go and I look at what the value of n is, and I put my file in that uh, seventh slot. And so eventually the score is going to read it, go down to seven, it prints out seven. Well, process A says, oh, what's the current value of n? Okay, oh, it's seven. All right, so I'm going to put my thing in there, my program that I want printed out in seven, and then I increment n equal n plus one. And then process B comes in and says, hey, what's the current value of n? It's eight. Okay, I'm going to put my file in 8 and then increment it to point to 9. Well, the problem with race condition is, let's say process A says, hey, what's the current value of n? 7, okay, it pulls it in. Now, I'm going to put my value in 7, but before it increments 7, it gets swapped out. And B says, hey, what's the current value of n? Oh, it's 7. So it writes its file into 7, overwriting what process A put in there and then finally increments it, so n goes to 8. We go back to process A, and so you know, you've already messed things up. Potentially, it can even increment A, so now, I mean, I increment n, so n points to 8, there's nothing in 8, and in 7, you overwrote the thing that you really wanted. So, in any case, race conditions are very bad. So how do we fix that? All right. One way to do that is to use what's called a mutual exclusion or blocking call. Okay. And you just say, hey, here's a critical region of code. I do not want you, any other process, from executing while I'm doing this. Okay. So when I, between the time I read in, put my file there, and I increment in, I don't want anybody to interrupt me. So we can say that is my critical region, and I don't I want exclusive access right now to that variable n and to the school while I'm in that region, <laughs> nobody else can touch it. Okay? And again, the critical region could be memory, you know, variable, it could be an IO buffer, a hard disk, or any resource really. Alright. So by using these mutual exclusion or critical regions, you can prevent processes from messing with each other, right? Well, one thought would be, okay, well, I'm just gonna start my critical region the very first line of a program, and I'm gonna end the critical region the very end line, end of my program. I don't have to worry about race conditions anymore. If we do that, what's gonna happen? Almost the exact opposite. If I've said, I start my program here, and I immediately block everything off, and I end the program and I allow things, can we ever run simultaneously anymore? <laughs> we can never swap out, right? So program A is gonna completely finish before I ever let program B in. Um, and the whole idea of time slicing is, hey, whenever program A gets to a point where it's blocked, then we're gonna let program B do its thing. But if we have the whole thing as an exclusive region, B will never get a chance to do its thing. So what you really want to do is these mutual exclusion zones or critical regions, you want to make them as small as possible, okay? So that as I'm doing my stuff and I get popped out, somebody else can get popped in, we do a context swap, now I can do my stuff, and I finally hit that one region that's super critical. I'm about to do that shared variable, I'm about to put something in the consumer buffer. That's where I need to say, hey, wait, nobody bug me but just these five lines of code. And then you can go back. 
So one of the important things about using critical regions or mutual exclusion is you want to limit the areas to as small as possible. Okay. Now, <clears throat> having critical regions alone will not completely prevent a race condition. You end up needing four conditions for a good solution. Number one, two processes can never be in a critical region at the same time. Okay. And part of that is, if this guy's in a critical region and this guy's in a critical region, they're both writing the same variable, that's the exact problem we want to try and fix, right? That's the whole idea of critical regions. So you can only have one person in a critical region at a time. All right, good. You can never assume anything about the speeds or number of CPUs or anything like that. You can't assume, well, the producer's always going to be called first, and then the consumer will be called. You cannot assume that. Because of the scheduling, you may end up calling a consumer before the producer ever gets called. So you have to write a little bit of code in there to say, hey, are we in a valid state? Um, no process running outside its critical region can block another process. And this is the idea of like deadlock. Because if I've got a process over here that blocks my process, and this process B over here is <coughs> in a critical region. So it started the critical region, it got halfway through, and it was about to let the critical region go and say, okay, everybody else can run now. And it got blocked. Well, guess what? It can never release its critical region, right? And everybody else who's waiting on that critical region can't run. And what's really bad is if this process over here that blocked that one is waiting on that critical region, it's blocked because of that one, and this one's blocked because of that one, guess what? Nobody's gonna run. That's what's called deadlock. So, to prevent that, a process running outside its critical region can never block another process. You can only block people when you're inside your critical region, okay? And then, just for fairness, you should never have a process have to wait forever to get to its critical region, okay? So those are the four things for a good <coughs> solution to prevent race conditions. Okay, you can't be in a critical region at uh, the same time in two places. You can't assume anything about speeds or, or which one runs first. You can't have this one outside a critical region blocking one. And you can't ever say, no one process is ever gonna be starved. It always has to at least be able to enter this critical region at some point. All right, <clears throat> so if we have process A and it starts, you know, it's doing its code, it's doing its code, it enters a critical region, so it's starting to do its stuff. Well, all of a sudden B says, hey, I'm ready. You know, let me do my thing. It's gonna say, wait a minute, I can't because somebody's already, process A is in its critical region. So I have to wait. I'm gonna put myself into a block state, even though all the other resources I need are available. You know, I could have been in a ready state, but because somebody else is in the critical region I need, I'm going to block myself. So whenever A leaves the critical region, it's going to say, okay, I'm gone, I'm out of there. Anybody who's waiting on this critical region can now run. B is going to get that and say, oh, great. Now I can go in, I can do what I need to do. It's going to set its critical region, do whatever it needs to do, and exit out. So does that make sense? So if we actually look at the code for something like that, we might have process one, it's gonna do this while true, so it's just gonna keep going and going and going and going forever. Um, and it's doing its code, you know, it's creating things or doing whatever it needs to do. It finally, it tries to enter the critical region. And usually there's gonna be a variable that you're gonna set based on that critical region, so you can have multiple critical regions uh, maybe I have a critical region for the CPU and a critical region for the memory. And so I can say, hey, I'm setting, I'm entering the critical region for memory. And process in over there is getting ready to go into its critical region for uh, CPU. That's fine. 
because the critical region for memory is completely different from the critical region for CPU. So we can both be in our critical regions as long as they're different regions. It's only when process one is going in critical memory region and process two tries to go into critical memory region that one of them has to be counted. <laughs> so you're always gonna send in which critical region are you talking about? In this case, region A. So here, I'm gonna do my code, I'm gonna try and go into critical region A, and if so, it lets me in, then I'm gonna do what I need to do, and then I'm gonna go ahead and exit the critical region. Same thing for process B. It's gonna do what it needs to do, it tries to go into A, it either is gonna be allowed in, or it's gonna be blocked. So, <clears throat> simple solution, single processor, is to say, all right, we're going to block everybody that's not in the critical region. Now, the problem becomes, what happens if we have an interrupt? Okay, so I'm getting ready, I'm starting to do my critical region stuff, and I get interrupted, and it goes to some other process, right? Well, what happens if I never get back to my process to close out my critical region? All of a sudden, we've got problems, right? So, interrupts really cause an issue with critical regions. So what's an obvious solution? Turn off the interrupts. All right, well that's good. Except that, now wait a minute, how do we know that we can switch from process A to process B? There are two ways to do it, right? One, you can voluntarily say, hey, I'm gonna give up control every 10 seconds. And you say, hey, I'm gonna do the trap, you go down and let the operating system see if anybody else needs it, otherwise it's going to put you back in. But do you really want to allow or require programmers to voluntarily give up control? Because, you know, hey, it's you know, 11.49 on finals day, are you really going to give up control and let somebody else have CPU to them? Are you going to keep it? <laughs> yeah. So, you know, people have a tendency not to be, you know, clear. So oftentimes they won't have it as user control, they put it down in the kernel. So it's now the kernel, the operating system's responsibility to make things fair, right? So it's gonna go ahead and say, hey, every 10 seconds I'm gonna interrupt you and let somebody else have time. Well, if a critical region can't be interrupted and we turn off interrupts, guess what? The kernel can't stop anybody from running anymore. So now, as soon as somebody goes into the critical region, they've got CPU from now on, right? Until they exit the critical region. So that doesn't work very well either. Um, just completely disabling interrupts means that there's gonna be no clock interruptions, therefore no mechanism for swapping, therefore you'll never switch between processes. So that's not really a great idea, all right? <clears throat> so somebody came up with the idea of a lock variable, all right? And a lock variable is gonna initially be set to zero. And when you say, hey, I wanna enter my critical region, it's gonna go out and it's gonna check the lock variable. If it's zero, then it's gonna say, great, you can go in, there's nobody else using it. And it sets that variable to one, okay? Now, if another process tries to go in, it's gonna check that same lock variable and it's gonna say, oh, it's one. I can't go in, it's locked, okay? The lock is on, it's got a one. Therefore, I'm just gonna wait. I'm gonna twiddle my thumbs, I'm gonna do a little while loop and spin around and spin around and spin around. And finally, whenever it's back to zero, then I'll go in, okay? Super simple solution, very easy to increment, I mean, to implement. Um, you can do it in software. You don't have to have a hardware solution for it. You don't have to have, uh, have interrupts, okay? So, can you see any downsides to this mechanism? Okay, anytime you're dealing with this kind of stuff, it's gonna take CPU time to check it, and you're gonna have space allocated to it. So it's a resource hog. But then again, I mean, as we talked about earlier, the whole operating system 
um, at all that code, I mean, it may end up eating half the time in order to give you the benefits of being able to, to run 10, 12 programs at the same time. So that's, that's a point. Well, what's the other point is, okay, if we're doing a lock, then we're reading the value, we're checking it. If it equals one, we go on, or if it equals zero, we go on and increment. Well, that's like four instructions, right? Get it, test it, set it. What happens if in the middle of setting my lock variable, I get swapped out and somebody else starts testing the lock variable? We've got another problem, right? I mean, we're using lock variables to prevent, you know, critical re or to implement critical regions, but the lock is now the critical region, right? So we still have the same problem. Okay, well, so somebody else came up with a slightly different algorithm and they said, okay, well, what if we alternate things, okay? And so process A, it goes in and it says, okay, I'm running and then now you get to run. And the next time it goes in, it says, okay, now I get to run and it does its critical region and it says, now you get to run, okay? So basically they have a shared variable that can have multiple states you can only enter a region when it's set to a certain state, okay? If you cannot enter the region because it's set to another state, then you just go into this busy way, you know, this while infinity loop. Uh, it's often called, when you implement a lock this way, it's often called a spin lock. So the code might look something like this. So process A, okay, we're gonna call it state zero. It can run whenever the state is zero. And process B can only run when the state's one, okay? So the code says, well, true, so I mean it's gonna do all the code, you know, constantly, go back and, and run and run around. But the important part is here, while turn is not zero, while it's not my turn, because this is process zero, then it's gonna spin, see this semicolon here? What's between the while and the semicolon? Nothing, right? So it's gonna do nothing over and over and over and over again. It's just gonna spin here until turn ends up being set to zero. As soon as turn is set to zero, it's now allowed to go into its critical region. <clears throat> so it's gonna do its critical region and say, okay, yay, I'm, I'm done. Once I'm done, now I can set turn equal to one do anything non-critical that I need to, go back up and, oh wait a minute, it's not zero, so I've got to wait. Well, this one's the same way, when it says, hey, if it's not one, I'm going to wait. Whenever this guy sets it to turn one, now I can do my thing, now I'm going to go ahead and set it back to zero. Okay. So you've got basically a two-state system here, where uh, um, each one's going to wait until it's turn. All right, well, that's one way to implement it. There's actually another way to implement it called uh, Peterson's solution. And basically, he went ahead and said, hey, um, I've got, in this case, two processes, uh, process zero and process one. Um, so when you try to enter the region, and you say, hey, I'm, I'm process zero. I want to come on in. So it says, okay, well, what's the other process? So one minus zero is going to be one. So the other process is one. Now, we're gonna go ahead and have this array saying, hey, I want to run my critical region. And it's gonna be an array of two things in this case. So you're gonna say, okay, um, interest, my process, my process is zero. I'm gonna say, yes, I am interested in running the critical region. And the kern, the turn is currently zero. Now, while turn is zero, and the other guy, because remember, I'm process zero, the other is process one. If the other is true, okay, um, so while the turn is me and the other is set to true, then I'm gonna spin. And it's only when the other is set to false, they're not trying to get into the critical region, and it's my turn, then I'll go ahead and do it. And it works the same way with the other guy. If you're, um, 
process one, you come in here, or zero, you come in, uh, one, one come in here, uh, one minus one can be zero, so the others will be zero. You say, hey, set zero to true, if it's your turn, the other one's not interested, then boom, we let it go. Whenever you leave a region, you just go ahead and say, hey, interest process equals false. Okay. So the thing that's different about this one, back here, um, both of these guys are trying to change turn, right? It's a shared variable. So you can have problems when one of them starts to change it, switches over, and the other one changes it. But if you look at this case, process one, okay, he's only ever changing his interest in process one. And process zero is only changing interest process um, zero or one, right? Now, you're looking at the other one, but you're only changing yours. That way, you never have process B or process zero changing process one's interest or vice versa. You're only changing your own interest. Therefore, you never have a problem about the two different guys changing. The <laughs> it's sort of subtle, but don't expect you to catch it the first time. Um, but go ahead and look over this a couple of times and get to the point that you can actually see, oh, I see how it's working. And I see why this is better than the other one. Does that make sense? Yeah. All right, well, part of the problem with the first solution was that you had to go ahead and look at the lock, get its current value, see if it's zero, increment. So there were like three steps. And if you got swapped out anywhere in those three steps, but after the third one, potentially you have a problem. So what if you had a special instruction? So the hardware architecture was set up that it had an instruction that did all three of those things as a single unit, okay? Then you could never have that test lock um, in a halfway state when you're swapped out. Because you either hadn't done the instruction or you had. Because it's all in one instruction. So some processors actually have a test and set lock instruction. So it's all done in a single um, instruction. Therefore, you don't have to worry about it being split halfway in half. All right, so basically, when you start to doing a lock instruction, it's going to go ahead, and if it's zero, it sets it to one. Um, if it's one, you're blocked, and when you're done, you just set it back to zero. So in your assembly code, it's going to look something like this. So you do a TSL, you do your test and set lock. Now, again, you're going to set that thing, but when you set it, you sort of have to know, well, was it in the zero state, or was it in the one state when I tried to set it? Because if it was in the zero state before I tried to set it, then I'm allowed to go on. If it was in the one state, I need to be blocked. Okay. So when the TSL, it's going to go ahead and set this to one. But it also tells you what was the state before I set it. Okay. So the register value coming back is either going to be zero or one. So when we compare it to zero, um, if it was zero, meaning we're good, then we can just jump, get out of return. We're done. If it wasn't, then we need to spin and just wait and wait and wait until it is. So we're going to go ahead and jump not equal um, back up to inner region. We're going to test it again, compare. Was it zero? Nope. Go back up. Was it, you know, so we keep going back up, going back up until it was zero when we tried to set it. Then we can get out. And on the same way, when you're going to leave the region, then all you have to do is set it back to zero. Does that make sense? So this is just an example of if the hardware has a dedicated instruction that's indivisible, therefore not interruptible, um, it's a much easier problem to solve. All right. Well. One bad thing about this code that we've looked at so far is you're in this wait semicolon 
routine, right? And you're just spinning and spinning and spinning and spinning. You, know, you check it, you check it, you check it. Is it, you know, is it zero yet? No. Nope. Is it zero yet? No. Nope. You're wasting tons of time, CPU cycles, um, just saying, are we done yet? So another solution is to say, hey, what if we had a sleep method that basically says, all right, I'm going to go ahead and um, say I'm not in a ready state. Put me back on the queue, and next time I'm up, then cool. As long as I'm in a sleep state, I'm not going to eat cycles. Now, that depends on somebody then waking me up. Yes? Uh, how is that different from like, the block state? Is it like because they're putting, it, putting themselves into it? Or? Yeah, uh, basically. Um, if you just put in the block state, you're going to be put in the block queue, and eventually you can come back up and you're going to go back to the ready, right? Mm -hmm. But if they've never said we're out of the critical region yet, it's sort of a waste to go back up into the ready state, right? Oh, okay. So instead of just being blocked and then ready and blocked and ready, mm -hmm. in that cycle, you really want to be put in almost a different queue or someplace else mm -hmm. saying, hey, I'm in the sleep state. Don't even try to run me until somebody says, hey, it's now valid to running me, mm -hmm. okay? And the way they do that is they call the um, awake or wake up. So what you do is you say, hey, I'm gonna go to sleep, and then when the producer uh, produces enough things that the consumer can run again, the produ it's up to the producer to say, hey, wake up. Then it says, oh, okay, great. Now I'm gonna put myself to the ready queue, and then when it's my turn, now I get to run. And I didn't have to waste any cycles going, are we done yet? Are we done yet? Are we done yet? I'm going to instead, it's basically like an interrupt. You know, it's going to go ahead and say, whenever you're done, send me the interrupt. I'll wake myself up, put myself in ready queue, and go. All right, so this is great. Now we have a wonderful solution where we can lock things, we have critical regions, and we don't have to spin CPUs on that spin lock. We now have sleeps and wake ups. Great. But what if we have priority queues? We have high priority processes and low priority processes, right? Well, maybe I'm a high priority process, and I'm doing, I'm going, and I say, okay, great. Somebody else has, put, uh, has uh, gotten into a critical region. I'm going to put myself to sleep. But that other process is a low priority queue. And they're never getting any CPU time. So they're never going to release that critical region, they're going to get out of the critical region, therefore they're never going to call wake up. So what happened to my high priority items? Yeah, I mean, it's stuck. That high priority item now basically has a lower priority than the lowest priority item, right? Because it's not going to run until that one runs. So if you have, and that's what they sort of refer to as a priority inverting. Um, and if you're, you can actually get in the states where you never get to run the higher priority because there's always other higher priorities mm -hmm. and the low priority never gets to its region and blah, blah, blah. So, in any case, when you have priority queues, even sleep and wake up aren't unlocked. So it's does something completely different. All right. Uh, and again, this is the produce consumer problem I've talked about before. You've got two processes. They're sharing the same buffer. One process reads, process reads from the buffer. The other process puts things into the buffer, okay? Problem is, you don't want a producer try to put something into a buffer that's already full, and you don't want a consumer try and pull something from a buffer that's empty, all right? So, <clears throat> one way is to go ahead and say, aha, we're just going to um, do a busy wait. You know, I'm, I'm the producer. I'm going to look out there. How many things are in the buffer? Oh, it's full. OK, I'll just wait, wait, wait. How many things now? How many things now? How many things now? Go. Not efficient. So instead, we can go ahead and put things to sleep. Now, if you're not careful, you can go ahead and end up in a race condition where this one's trying to update, well, this is how many things are in the buffer. At, you know, as a producer, it's going to go ahead and add one more thing, where the consumer is going to go ahead and try and subtract things as it eats them. 
and one of them reads it, the other one updates it, and then updates it, and we just wipe each other out. So, how are we going to fix this? Well, number one, we're going to say int uh, count um, is the size of the buffer. You know, if there's n things in the buffer, there's 10 places in the buffer, um, then as soon as we filled up that 10th thing, then we want to put the producer to sleep. And the same way is if the count ever goes to zero, we want to go ahead and put the consumer to sleep because there's nothing there to consume. All right. Once the producer puts something into the buffer, so it goes above zero, then we can wake up the consumer. And once the consumer has pulled something out of the, uh, the buffer, then it can wake up the producer. All right, so the code's gonna look something like this. We're gonna go ahead and set n to whatever, however big our buffer is. We're gonna set our count to zero. So n is like how many things, hold on, the size of the buffer, the count is how many things are currently in the buffer. So our producer is gonna be in this infinite loop. It's gonna create an item. If the count is currently in, then I'm gonna go to sleep. If it's not in, then I'm gonna go ahead and insert the item I just produced. I'm gonna go ahead and put count equals count plus one, right? But if it was zero, which meant there was nothing in there, so the consumer is probably asleep, I just put one thing in there, in other words, the count's now one, then I wanna go ahead and wake up the consumer. So basically, I've got two things here. If it's full, I'm gonna to go to sleep as a producer. And if it was empty, I'm gonna wake up the consumer. <coughs> well, the consumer is the exact opposite. If it was, uh, if there's nothing in there, then I'm gonna to go to sleep. And if it's full, or if it was full, um, and I just ate something, then there's now room to put something in there, so I'm gonna wake the consumer back up. So you have the idea of how that works? Does that sort of make sense? All right. Problems with that. See any problems with that? Why? Uh, I thought, I guess maybe I'm reading it wrong. I thought, um, if, I thought it was when the count equals in that it wakes up the consumer. Um, the consumer only needs to have one thing in there. Okay and it can consume that one thing, right? Mm -hmm. So when it's zero, you want to stop the consumer. Okay. As long as there's anything in there, you can start it back up. Okay. Now, depending on what code you look at, sometimes it says, hey, I want to be completely full before I start the consumer up, mm -hmm. because if I only put one thing in and immediately consumes it, it has to go immediately back to sleep. Mm -hmm. And so there's some context switching. So sometimes they say, hey, I want it all the way full before I wake the consumer back up. Okay. And it'll start eating things. Mm -hmm. That's that's a whole different issue. Okay. At this point, you just know that if it's in a state I can't do, I should go to sleep. So on a producer, that means when it's full. On a consumer, when it's empty. Mm -hmm. And then whenever it's in a state that I can do something, so a producer, it's not full, or a consumer, it has something, whether it's one or n items, um, then go ahead and wake me back up. So, hey, cool, this should work, right? What's the possible problem? Why did we, why did they invent the TSL? Why do we have exclusive regions, critical regions? Right, so what if the producer reads count and before it actually increments count, the consumer goes and changes its value and then we swap back and the producer changes its value. It's the same thing we've had before, right? This implementation is not gonna work because we can swap out. We, haven't, we don't have any TSLs, we don't have any critical regions, we don't have any anything preventing the count from being changed partially in both of them at the same time, right? So, how do we fix that? All right, one solution is to go ahead and add um, you know, those critical regions, or we can even have a bit 
take care of um, when to wake up and when not to wake up. This ends up not even being a very good general approach. So there's some other ones. Let's go to that before we really talk about this. I hate to go into too much detail on this one because it ends up with problems with it. So how can we how can we fix that? Well, one thing is called a semaphore, okay? And it's a special value, usually implemented as an integer, to keep track of critical regions, all right? So each process that wants to look at a critical region, it checks the semaphore, okay? And the semaphore says, hey, yeah, you're good, then you can go into that set of code. If the semaphore is in a bad state, you cannot go into that code, right? And so either you spin lock it, you know, you just go to awake or go to sleep or whatever. So by looking at this semaphore, this gatekeeper, it can go ahead and say, yes, you can go in, no, you can't. All right. Um, sometimes you implement this with a monitor. Um, if the region's full, you go to sleep. One of the important things about semaphores are they are a tunnel, okay? Meaning it's gonna take the pull the value, test the value, set the value is all in one indivisible unit, just like the PSL. Yes? Uh, I don't think critical region can only hold like one process at a time. We're, we're going to generalize this now. Okay. okay. So in the past, it was either zero or one, right? Mm -hmm. Well, with semaphores, you can actually set it to a value n. Okay. Yeah. This is, this is the, the, now that you've got everything down with, with zeros and ones, now we're going to say an n number of things. Okay. Uh, and then what we end up doing is when we use that for the consumer producer problem, where we have a buffer size of 10, then we can go bump, 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 and we'll see that. All right, so one of the important things is semaphore, semaphores are uh, a tunnel. They're indivisible. You're never going to get it halfway through. So that's going to solve that one problem. All right, so a general implementation of a semaphore is just you've got ups and downs. So if you call uh, down on the semaphore, it's going to take that count. And again, the semaphore data structure has got to count the queue. That count is initialized to some value. Every time you call down, it's going to subtract one. If count is ever less than zero, you know, so process says, hey, I want to run down, and the count is less than zero, then you say, ah, that process has to be put in the wait loop. Now, whenever you call process up, then it looks down there and it says, oh, okay, we're going to add one account. And if the count is less than or equal to zero, then I'm going to pull something out of the queue and say, okay, now you can run. So basically, we're going to use this semaphore and say, hey, I'm going to down it as I go into my critical region. When I'm done, I'm going to hit the up and come out of the critical region. So if we actually look at an example of this, all right, so in this case, we're gonna do a semaphore where S equals one, okay? And then I'm gonna say down. So it's gonna go from one to zero, right? Well, zero is still okay. So it's gonna be able to process whatever it's gonna do. It's gonna then say up, and it's gonna go from zero back up to one. Everything's cool. If I have two processes running, the first one, S was one, it goes into this critical region, it downs it, so now it's zero, it gets to execute. Then we swap out, the other process comes in, it hits down, well, it was zero, now it's at negative one. So it's gonna go into a wait state, right? Mm -hmm. Well, whenever process one finally says, okay, I'm gonna do an up, it's gonna go from zero, uh, from negative one to zero, and again, if we look at the previous code, uh, if it's less than or equal to zero, then I'm going to pull something out of the queue and let it run. Okay, yes? Okay. So if I'm understanding this, if you start at one, yep. the first time you call down, you get a zero, yep. you get placed in the critical region. Or, um, no, no, no. If it's less than zero. Oh, okay. If it's equal to zero, you can still run. Okay. If it's less than zero, you have the second, third, or fourth process that's trying to get it, mm -hmm. then you can put the queue. Okay. All right? But if you um, if you have less than zero already, how can you get to like negative two or three? Um, you just call up. 
I mean, let's say you had four processes running. Because mm -hmm. see, we're, we're generalizing. We're not just talking about two things now. Maybe we have four processes running. Mm -hmm. And so the first one goes, and it goes to zero, and it gets run. Yeah. And then the second one goes to negative one, and then negative two, and then negative three. Uh -huh. But when we do an up, negative three is less than or equal to zero, we pop one thing out of the queue. Uh -huh. And the next time, it pops out of the queue, and then it pops out of the queue. So now, using semaphores, we can actually have 10 different producers or consumers all running at the same time. And this will actually allow only one of them potentially to run, right? Mm -hmm. But wait a minute. What if we had set that not to one? What if we had set S to two? Hey, we have two CPUs. So the first time it runs, it goes from two down to one, it lets it go, right? And then the second one would also get to go. The second one, it goes from uh, one down to zero, it gets to go. The third process comes in, it goes to negative one, it gets put the cube. Mm -hmm. Make sense? Mm -hmm. So now we, with semaphores, have a way to say, oh, <clears throat> I have multiple resources, and I can have multiple things trying to process, trying to use that resource, and it still works. But this is actually a pretty cool representation. It was generated by a Dutch programmer, and so a lot of times uh, in Dutch, speak Dutch, not even going to try, but there's a word called that starts with P um, that means test. And then there's another word that starts with a B that means increment. So oftentimes when you see things, you'll sometimes see P and B semaphores, and that's from the original Dutch uh, article on, on this. Right. Okay. So, if the semaphore has a value of one, it's called a binary semaphore. It's either zero or it's one, right? Um, but the cool thing about semaphore is that you can set it to something other than one, <clears throat> in which now you can go ahead and say, hey, I've got n number of processes trying to use m number of things, uh, and it still works. So this is a very common way of locking critical regions? Yes. Oh, well, I was just curious. Um, this would work in tandem with like the virtualization, right? Mm -hmm. like convincing that we have, so you can have one physical CPU mm -hmm. tell the program that you have four and then use like a value of like four for your reader, something like that? Yeah, exactly. So this is the mechanism, or at least another version of this, that we will be using or the virtualization machine will be using to share m number of resources with n number of processes. All right. Um, now, this does need a little bit of kernel support, okay, in order to work. And one of the problems is, like we've seen before, if you got interrupted halfway between you and our PNB, you know, if we were you know, right in this code right here, you know, we've done the, the minus minus, and then we get blocked out, um, and then an up happens and it plus pluses, mm -hmm. then when you start to test it, all of a sudden you have problems, right? Mm -hmm. So you have to go ahead and be able to say, wait a minute, this area of the semaphore has to either be a single instruction, like the TSL, the you know, test set lock, or we need to stop interrupts. Well, we know stopping interrupts completely is a bad idea, but you can also stop interrupts temporarily for just a short period of time. Aren't these semaphores atomic? I thought they weren't interruptible. Yeah, um, yeah and, and that's basically what this is saying is oh, okay. you have to have <coughs> that. Um, you have to have kernel support. In other words, this has to be an atomic thing. Okay. okay. Um, that's what they're trying to say is you either have to implement it uh, as an atomic thing using critical reading, or you have to have kernel support like a TSL. You have to have a single instruction in order for this to work. So, let's look back at our producer consumer problem, but this time we're going to use semaphores. So, <clears throat> We're going to have one semaphore, we're going to call it 
mutex, or mutually exclusive. We're going to have one semaphore for empty, and we're going to have one semaphore for full. All right? So when we go into our producer, we're going to go ahead and say, yeah, I'm going to do my non-critical thing. I'm going to produce an item. But then before I actually insert the item in the buffer, I'm going to number one say empty is going to go down. Okay. Um, and since I'm the only one messing with empty, I can do that outside the critical region. So the producer is only going to mess with the empty. The consumer is only going to mess with the full. Okay? And that's sort of what we saw earlier when we had the interest. I'm interested in doing the process. But when we actually go here, when we're actually going to push the item into the buffer, we need to be um, in a critical region, right? So now we're going to go ahead and do down on mutex. And again, mutex only has a, a one, right? So it can either be one, we subtract it down to zero, and the other guy will get blocked. So now we down our mutex. Now we're in our critical region. We can insert the item. And as soon as we insert the item, we're going to do up on mutex, saying, OK, I'm out of my critical region. Anybody can use it now. And then I'm going to go ahead and up full. So we're like layering some cores. Exactly. So yeah. you have the you have the semaphore empty, and that can, uh, that's like in control of the uh, the count of slots. Mm -hmm. But then you have mutex, whose like sole purpose is just entering and exiting the critical region. Yep. Okay. And this is typical. I mean, you have to do the critical region, and often you have to deal with resources, right? And you don't want two people messing with the resource at the same time, so you can implement a symbol for that. But as you're changing that, then that's a critical region, so you don't want uh, two people changing at the same time, so you put a mutex around it. Um, now, this would work. What you don't want to do is like down empty, down mutex, up full, and then up mutex. Um, so you've got to make sure that you're, it's just like open and close brackets. You know, you want to make sure you, you, you know, open this one, close this one, then open this one and close this one. You don't want to flip flop the two. What would happen if you did? Um, work through it. Get a piece of paper and a pencil out and try that. See what happens. And feel free to, uh, uh, you've already got a presentation, but oh, yeah. in any case. Um, let's just say bad things can happen. And a lot of, and part of the problem is, again, it depends on how things go. If this one produced three, and then this one consumed three, everything's going to be fine. If this one produces one, and this one tries to consume two, it would actually be okay. But if this one you know, if it goes the other way, then I'll have problems. So there's, there is a way in which things can go bad, but because <coughs> we have no assurance that this one's ever going to run before that one, we don't have any assurance about timing or how often this one's going to be done by that one. We don't know whether we're always going to be in a valid state or not. So, okay, so the last couple of seconds. Uh, mutex. It's a shared variable with a binary state, it's either locked or unlocked. It's very easy to implement if you have a TSL instruction in the um, uh, kernel. You need to make sure it cannot be interrupted. Um, now, a mutex is similar to the TSL, but it ends up avoiding the busy wait. And because of that, you can go ahead and do implement binary semaphores without a lot of uh, overhead. So they're a pretty cool thing. And again, your mutex is just going to say, hey, do a TSL on that mutex variable. See what the value is. If it's zero, then cool. Um, if it's not, then we want to go ahead and yield to a friend. Or basically go to sleep. Um, and then whenever you're done, you just go ahead and uh, set back to the Examples in uh, POSIX then obviously you've got to create a mutex variable. Eventually you're going to destroy it. Um, and then your three other things are you try to lock it, 
right, you, know, you can lock it, you can try to lock it, or you can unlock it. Um, so that's all that. Um, again, the exact same code uh, using those mutex calls. And at this point, let's go ahead and stop. Uh, I know some of you will have classes after this. And we'll pick up with monitors uh, next time.